Hey there neighbors and naysayers, Clint Finney again with part two of how to stockpile grass. In, in this section, I'm gonna go a little more in depth in some systems that I kind of worked out uh, using the models that I produced uh, that I think will help us to produce some more stockpile grass. Now, they're, they're by no means time-tested uh, systems. They're just uh, guidelines and, and examples that I think I've come up with with the models that I think some of us can use uh, on our own operations. I don't want anybody to take the exact numbers to heart, but what I wanted to do is produce sort of a roadmap and, and something that maybe someone could follow to help them produce more stockpile grass. So let's get started. I want to talk now about some systems that I've come up with that I think might help us to stockpile some grass. And I'm going to talk about each one separately, but just know that we're going to talk about some systems. These may or may not fit your operation. Uh, and, and of course, I've planned them out in the perfect year or in the average year. And so they may not always work. And some of the numbers I've put to it may not exactly work, but at least it maybe gives us a roadmap, maybe gives us a benchmark, something to start with and, and work out from there to help us produce some more stockpile grass and, and graze longer in the year. First one I'm gonna talk about is what I call, or been calling fall tall grass grazing. And this is the system that I set out to, to kind of work out when I started all these models and started thinking about extending the grazing season or extending my grazing season further than it already was. But it basically consists of setting aside an amount of forage or amount of pasture uh, from, from the start of the growing season in March until August when the time of starting to stockpile would be. And then grazing that tall forage in that, that August to November time period while we're allowing the rest of the farm to rest and regrow and produce stockpile grass. Uh, of course, I'm referring to grazing tall grass, perennial cool season pastures, namely fescue. Um, that's the kind of pasture we'd be looking at. Now, maybe this tall grass section may consist of some other species, uh, may consist of something that's red clover that we wanted to go to seed or something like that, but we would be leaving the rest of the farm to stockpile, and we would consider that most of the time it would be stockpiled tall fescue. Uh, because most of our pastures in eastern Ohio are fescue dominant or becoming more fest fescue don dominant. My estimates are around 40 to 45 percent of the production units. Notice I said production unit, they're not acres because acres, as we talked about, is different yields. Um, I was hoping when I, when I started doing these calculations that I could come up with a system that I could set aside like 30 percent, 33 percent of our farm. The reason I was thinking of that was because uh, for, for regenerative reasons, for soil health reasons, if we had good red clover in all of our pasture fields and we left 33% of it to go wild and go to seed every year to go tall, that red clover would go ahead and go seed and, and then we'd have new red clover seed down in the pasture field. If we had 33% of it, we could do a third of the farm every year and always keep a decent crop of red clover in our pasture field. Unfortunately, the, the numbers just didn't work out. It works out to 40 to 50 percent, but that that's okay too. I mean, we're we're leaving that to grow tall. We're leaving the roots to grow deep, and the soil health folks will tell you the roots grow deep. They pull up fertility from down below that we're we're normally not capturing. Uh, it, it could be a real benefit, other than the fact of leaving something grow kind of tall and shaggy through the growing season. So these are kind of the, the charts and the mapping out. The first one on the top left, you'll see that would be, uh, I said 40 to 45%. So that would be the 60 acres that we're, no, we're not leaving to grow tall, tall grass, tall growth. And, and it kind of shows in the green line, the forage production. The blue line is, is the livestock needs. And then moving over to the top right, uh, that would be the 40% the that we've kind of left grow. And you got that whole season long forage curve there and how much the livestock would consume in that August to, to November time period. The, the chart's kind of deceiving there because of the way the line has to come up, but uh, basically that's grazing it from August to November. And then the bottom chart, of course, is our fall stockpile. So that's that 60 acres. Uh, if we moved off of it, graze the tall grass in August to November, uh, this is the stockpile in the green line, and the blue line would be the grazing line, what we what we would consume. So you can see those all kind of match up pretty good right there, just to give you a visual of what, of what I'm talking about as far as grazing. Hopefully that's a, a pretty good visual. Now we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of, of this, this kind of system. 
Um, first, you know, by setting aside 40, 45% of our pasture, it, it'll reduce the amount of land that we'll have to manage for seed heads. We're gonna let that 40% go to seed. But the other 60% now, we've got a smaller area that we've got to manage and maybe a little bit easier to keep it from going reproductive, to keep it vegetative. Now, detriment though, that 40 acres is gonna be pretty inefficient. It's not gonna to grow to its full production potential uh, because we're letting it just go all season long. Uh, any of you that mowed hay in late July and then tried to make a second crop know that you're better off to make three cuttings as far as production goes. It would be the same with, with grazing that tall grass forage. The tall grass would also be lower quality. Although I don't know that it would be so low that we would even, we would really notice it. I, I honestly, a, a really good pasture, managed pasture system is probably too good for a lot of our beef cows anyway. And that fall time, the cows have, have calved, they, they've kind of went through their, their high production time. We're getting close to weaning. Some of us may have already weaned them by then. Maybe we really need a kind of lower quality forage time in our system anyway. And, and I still say the quality would probably still be good enough to carry a beef cow or a, or a ewe through that time period. We, we may be concerned and we may need to have some protein tubs or something like that, but if, if it comes down to getting us more stockpile, I think it's probably worth it. We need to look at that as a reseeding and regenerative time. I, I talked about that in the previous slide, but it's a time when we can add to our seed bank and when we can grow soil organic matter in that 40% of the, the, the pasture field. And, and even though we're setting that aside and we're saying we're gonna graze it tall grass, we'll probably have to graze that twice before we would get into our stockpile grass. We'll have to re grow, graze the regrowth of that area, regraze the regrowth of that area in order to leave the rest of our farm to stockpile. And, and, I, and the reason why I couldn't get this system to work back when I was trying to do it initially is because I was trying to do it without nitrogen. And I don't think a system like this works without the addition of some commercial nitrogen or manure applied to the rest of the farm in order to grow some stockpile. I don't think we can make it work efficiently. We've got to tackle the efficiencies of letting that grow tall and we've got to overcome it by applying nitrogen to the rest of the, the growing area. Next one we're going to talk about is uh, spring mob grazing or what I've coined as spring mob grazing and this is a system that I kind of used last year although I didn't come up with the idea until it was too late to do it. But I decided if we were going to do it, we needed to go ahead and do it right then. There was no sense in keeping on going the way we had been going in the past few years. So I saw some of the benefit of it, but I'm really excited for this year because I think we can really make this work. But it basically consists of quickly getting our forages back in a vegetative state during the spring flush, not letting the spring flush get ahead of us. And I know we've talked about how hard that is to manage, but at that point, if we get through the spring flush, keep everything vegetative, and then we would slow down our rotation, only topping the forage with each grazing pass and only taking what the livestock meets or needs are. So that, that essentially we would be stockpiling underfoot. We would always have growth underneath of them coming up and we'd just be barely topping that forage. We may be grazing the red clover and they'll leave the fescue behind or grazing the really vegetative stuff and leaving the fescue behind. Uh, but in this way, we're kind of building stockpile underfoot. And I think about this in terms of grazing in inches, meaning that, you know, we're going to graze it to a four inch height, say in April and a six inch height in May and a 12 inch height in July and a 10 inch height in, in August. And, and I got the numbers here in the next slide, but I think about this in grazing. Of course, we got the spring flush to deal with, so it's not exactly that, but it, it's close and it's a good way to think about it. To show you that I did actually do the math, I built a spreadsheet to figure this out for me. And that's a lot of numbers and a lot of junk, but the biggest thing for y'all to look at is the far right-hand column. That's the cumulative inches. After the livestock have, it's what has grown and what the livestock have taken. So you can see we start the year at 3.87 inches. I, I ran this for several years, so that's why I'd rather, really rather start at like four inches. But then you can see the cumulative inches as we go down. Uh, April is almost five. May 7, June 11, July 11, then we go down in inches <clears throat> until we get to the end of the year, which is going to end up around 2.72 inches. So in, in the end, we, we, we took more than we had because we're, we're into that four inch uh, residue that I'd like to leave. 
but also remember this is grazing through the entire winter. Uh, if we would set that aside and, and, and feed hay for 30 days, then we would probably see an increase in our residue year over year at, at, then rather than a, a decrease. And it's just a model to kind of show me that it was possible, that it is possible to do that if we can keep that spring grass vegetative instead of it going to seed. So I talked about the, the 1.5 or 1.15 inches that we were we were shortened. I think the first time I ran this, I came out short. I was like 0.5 inches or 0.2 inches or something like that short. I've run it multiple, multiple times now, but the first time, and that really bothered me. And I thought, well, where can I, where can I make this up? And the answer is we make it up in, in feeding some more hay in the winter time. But as I, I went forward, I, I started really, that, that was, that was really bothering me. So I thought about this in terms of the angel share. This is what we're hoping that gets provided to us. We hope that our management and our, our efficiencies is going to do that. And it's kind of a funny story that the angel share comes from a term from where they make Scotch whiskey in Scotland. And, and so much of it leaks out of the barrel. It evaporates out of the barrel. And they call that the angel share so much so that it leaves kind of a black mark above the vents of the building. And they, they always refer to that as the angel share. And I, I looked at that number, that negative number and said, well, that's the angel share. We're hoping that will produce itself. We're hoping our efficiencies will bring that forward. But as I got to thinking about it, I started, I, I had started calling this whole plan, this whole process, the Kenny Miller plan after our good friends, Harry Kenny and Cliff Miller. And, and it just, it just made me chuckle that I was calling it the angel share and, and also get the whole plan I was calling the, the Kenny Miller plan. And I'm, I'm a sucker for, for sentimental things. And as I'm doing this, I could just think, and, and, and sorry that Cliff isn't there to share this all because I could just see him looking back and, and thinking about this and really asking me questions. And, and Harry was such an influence in me and, and grazing and, and talking about stockpile grass and grazing through the winter that I just thought it was interesting to share with you all that, I you know, I come up with that extra being or that, that negative being the angel share. And I had already started calling this plan the Kenny Miller plan. And it, it just kind of made me chuckle to think about our, our dear friends and, and their passing. So this is a line chart just showing that this whole spring mob grazing idea. So the green line is the forage production. So if we left the forage to just grow the entire season, starting out there around four inches, and it, it would end up making around 30 inches of, of total forage. The black line is the, the livestock and, and what they eat as far as cumulative. They would start out there near zero, and, and they would eat somewhere between 25 and 30 inches of forage in a year. So the, the brown line is that cumulative number. So if the livestock were eating the forage as it grew, this is how many inches of forage we would need to have each month. And again, by no means though, I think that we have to follow this to the letter, but it's just a good thought. It's good to see in your mind that, you know, say in May or June, we need somewhere above 10 inches. We need to carry that through July. And then we can let that, that inch count kind of drop in September to right at 10 inches, it will build back up over October. And then we're going to eat all that forage down back to that four inch height by the time we get to the end of February, early March, and we start the grazing season over again. Now, some of you are going to hang up on that springtime. How am I going to keep that grass vegetated? Well, the answer is I'm going to move them very fast. We're going to try to cover the farm three to four times in the first 60 days of grazing. And, and how I'm going to do that, the picture kind of alludes to it. That's a bat latch that Gallagher makes, but there are other companies that make sort of similar things that will automatically open the gate and allow, allow the cows to move. And that's what we plan on doing. I mean, y'all know that I move cows two and three times a day. Anyway, my plan next spring is to move cows three, four, five, six times a day in order to cover the whole farm between the first seed head and July 5th or June 15th, June 21st. I want to get everything covered, everything mogged between that time to try to shut down the seed head. And we're going to use a, a stock density somewhere between 50 and 100,000 pounds. I figure we're going to have to move five or six times a day. I'll move them in the morning before I go to work. Uh, the, the bat latches or, or whatever I use will move them two or three times during the day. I'll move them when I get home. And I'll move them once more before dark in order to cover that much ground and just try to keep it as vegetative as we can. 
Now, spring mob grazing will have some losses due to the trampling. Sure, sure. we're going to lose some. This is just because of the inefficiencies we had in the tall grass grazing. We'd have that same thing or a little bit of that same thing in the spring mob grazing. But we're hoping that, that what we trample will just become food for the soil health and will turn back around and, and end up being production. And then our fall grazing ro rotations will be somewhere near 60 days. We'll break the farm up into 60 paddocks and we'll just rotate kind of leisurely around the farm. Trying to keep the rotations or the paddock st stops as infrequent as possible. Uh, if I could get away with 90 days, I'd do 90 days in the fall. I don't think I could get away with it. But the reason for that is utilization. Everything that cow drops manure on, everything she steps on, is food I'm not going to get. So I don't want her to go back there multiple, multiple times. Another system, if this, if this fits you, if it fits your operation, is returning hay acres to the grazing system. We're basically making hay on a part of your grazing system. If your forage system is in balance, if you get your forage system in balance, I figured that you can make about 20% of the spring flush in hay. Now, now we need to make that as soon as humanly possible. So I'm talking about late May, probably latest as possible. Uh, and this system would reduce the amount of, of forage that you have to worry about keeping, veg keeping vegetative. Uh, you'd have to manage 80% of your pasture instead of 100% of your pasture to keep it from going to seed. Um, but it, it, it relies on A, the forage being in balance, B, that you can get on your pasture and be able to make 20% of it in hay, and then that we harvest it as soon as humanly possible. And then once that, that hay field, pasture field, has sufficiently regrown, we would throw it back into being pasture again. And we'd manage it much the same way we would that, that mob spring mob grazing kind of system where we would just rotate kind of leisurely around the farm, pick, make 60 paddocks and just rotate around it. But uh, this would implement a long rest period for those fall months, just, just like we needed, just like we talked about. And again, nitrogen would need to be applied to the, the winter feeding or winter stockpiling area in order to make this system work. We're taking hay out of the system. If our forage system's in balance, we're now taking hay out of it. We're going to have to add nitrogen to make up for what we took out. And we're going to have to feed that hay eventually, hopefully in that 30 day, 60 day, whatever your time period is that you want to feed hay. The last system that might help us produce stockpile grass is taking advantage of warm season annuals or perennials. Um, we can plant warm season annuals, perennials, uh, in order to help us get through that summer slump time and in order to let the rest of our cool season perennials go ahead and grow and stockpile. Um, if we if we grew warm season grasses, it'd be much like that tall grazing type type situation. And I figured here again we could we could plant about 20% of our pasture area to to a warm season grass of some kind, and it would help us to stockpile grass. With perennials, though, we got to know that we've got to quit grazing them about October October 15th, and we've got to leave an eight inch residue. So now we've got a hole from October to November when we start grazing stockpile grass. That we've got to fill and we may fill that with tall grass cool season grasses we may fill it with some kind of annual we may fill it with an annual later in the in the stockpile season we may also rotate our, over the stockpiled area really quickly to allow the livestock to take out the red clover and really vegetative stuff that's not going to survive the winter anyway and then with cool seasons with with annuals excuse me annuals you know we could grow a warm season annual and then turn around and plant that same area back to a cool season annual and be able to graze the warm season annual in the summer slump, graze the cool season annual later in the winter because uh, they'll survive the winter better than our, our stockpile will, uh, be able to graze that say February, March uh, to get us through the winter and, and that, that cool season annual basically becomes part of our winter feeding and our stockpile system. All right, so any of these systems I believe would work. I, you know, I'm just giving you kind of a roadmap, some numbers, some things to work with, but any of them would have to be worked in over a three to five year period. And that's a picture there of our steers at home. Uh, we always put our steers and our replacement heifers in the stockpile group because I want them to learn what it's like to have to work through the winter. Uh, I, I can put some cows in there if I've got enough stockpile. I can put the sheep in there if I've got enough stockpile, but the first two groups, to always go on stockpile are our replacement heifer and our fat steers for the next year. Any of these systems should get us to that crucial rest periods in the spring and in the fall. A short, fast rotation in the spring, 15 to 30 days. A long, slow rotation in the, in the fall, being 60 days or more when the forage is growing slowly. 
and any of these systems require us getting some or all of our forage back vegetative as fast as possible in the spring. So I want to talk just a minute about feeding hay as it relates to stockpile. Just just know that I mean I, I'm a I'm a stockpile fan. I, I would prefer to feed stockpile, but but also feeding hay for a while isn't all bad. There are reasons why we need to feed hay or store forages. It, it's actually more efficient to be feeding hay for 30 days in the winter than to graze through the entire winter most of the time. We can have a few more cows to help pay for that hay, to help offset the cost. And also that hay that we're feeding is replenishing the nutrients that we lose to the cow and calf. We don't lose many nutrients by feeding cows and calves or sheep, but we lose about 10%. So every year when those feeder cattle go to town, they take about 10% of our fertility with them. So it's not a bad thing that we feed that hay back. And I would suggest even if we're going to stockpile grass, we're still going to feed hay for a month or two out of the winter. I think it's possible to get down to only feeding hay for a month or two. But I'd still plan on storing three to five months of hay as insurance against deep snow, ice, very wet and muddy conditions. And, and, and every time I talk about stockpile, I get a, I get the what if. The what if crowd says, well, what if? What if we get snow? Well, Beth looked this up the other day. The longest consecutive days of snow in our area was 1978. It was 63 days of snow. We just came through a really long period of snow here. We had snow for almost three weeks. And and I actually that was that was great for me because I knew I had to feed hay for 30 days anyway, so I used that three weeks to just feed the hay that we were going to feed. But we can't let snow cover worry us as long as we've got the insurance, the bank account of three to five months of hay, or the money in our bank account to buy that hay. As it relates relates to feeding hay, we also need to think about any winter sacrifice area, any area that we've torn up feeding hay needs to be seeded quickly back to some sort of forage something hopefully that will help during our summer slump and we also need to think about seeding that back using that as an opportunity to seed back forages we don't have perennials or annuals and and seeding back a good mix of grass legumes and forage and then then the, the last wild idea i think i'll leave you with and part of what i did here today was thinking about this i read about a guy in tennessee who fed hay for 90 days he had his entire hay supply he fed it all in 90 days before winter and that allowed his farm to re rest and regrow, and he grew enough stockpile grass to graze through his typical 120-day winter, winter without feeding a bale of hay. That's an odd thought. Your neighbors would think you're crazy, but I've shown you the numbers that they, they eat more or eat the same amount in the 90 days before winter as they eat during the winter in the 120, 150 days of winter. So really and truly, you could feed your hay in the fall when it's dry, and graze stockpile, graze wintered, stored forages on the stump through the winter and do that through the muddy time and not have to deal with the mud that we typically deal with in Eastern Ohio. So I wanna talk about the joys of stockpile grass. Uh, this is just a review of the things we went over. If you don't take anything home from what I've said today, I'd like for you to take this home. We must have the amount we wish to stockpile available in July instead of November. If you don't take anything else home, that was my aha moment. And that's what I want you guys to know, that we need that amount in July, not in November. Because the amount in July is going to get us to November and the grass will regrow in that time period. we got to keep an emergency supply of stored forages in case of drought or things not going as planned. And then if you're going to stockpile grass, don't be discouraged if we don't hit our target. Um, some stockpile is better than nothing. I have to remind myself of that every year when I go out and estimate how much stockpile we're going to have. It's always less than I'd hoped for. And every time I have to remind myself, some is better than nothing. I'm just glad I've got some. And and they're here wrapping up. I, 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 I've i never been more excited to give a presentation than I have this one. Um, in fact, I wish I had another six months to prepare this, but I wanted to get this information out. I have never been more excited about a presentation. I feel like I finally cracked the code. We, we talk so much about short rests in the spring, long rests in the fall, and I've never been able to make that work with our livestock. But this last year with spring mob grazing, I was able to make it work. I was actually able to get a longer rest period in the fall, just like the books have told us we should do all this time. And then remember, we practice management intensive grazing. We don't ever master it. You know, 20 years almost of grazing, and, and I just finally come up with some of these ideas and some of these new thoughts. And, and, and I think of 
one of my old bosses told me at one time that, that that medicine is the practice of medicine, not the mastery of medicine. Doctors don't master medicine, they practice medicine. We should feel the same way about management intensive grazing. We practice it. We don't ever have it mastered. Well, that's a wrap for How to Stockpile Grass, part two. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed this presentation as much as I enjoyed giving it to all of you. Um, I, I sure wish I, I had six months or a year more to work on it, but I felt like it was good enough information that we needed to go ahead and get it out to all of you so that you could start planning for the grazing season that's fastly approaching. Uh, also, we wish we would have recorded this live at the grazing council meeting the other night. We had some really good discussion, really good questions. I had to go back over the presentation and make sure I covered everything that we talked about. Even then, it was a lot better presentation live, of course, than it was recorded. And we're sorry that we didn't get it recorded in real time. Um, but thank you all for tuning in. We sure do appreciate it. With that, I'll say we'll see you next time.